welcome to Oliver DeWald, your guide to the finer things in life. And before I start, the following contains spoilers for Portal 1 and 2, so if you haven't played them yet, seriously, what the f***? And you don't want them spoiled, then you go play My Little Pony or something, piss off. There's few things I despise more than people, so a piece of interactive entertainment that's all about isolation, solitude, and making fun of fat people is just peachy. So it should come as no surprise that I love the original Portal, with its fun puzzles, dry wit, and a villain so caustic and so acerbic that I'd gladly do her proper if I was into robots. Hell, I'd still br before t But for all its unique challenges, sharp dialogue, and glorious fat shaming, yeah, like a beached whale. For all of that, the characters were a bit underdeveloped. We were gifted with one of the funniest villains in gaming's history, but without much context. GLaDOS just sort of reveled in sarcasm and the sort of passive-aggressive venom that usually requires a marriage. We had no idea why she enjoyed testing so much and torturing poor fools like Chell. Portal 2 provided that context, and a whole lot more. While about 99.9% .9 of the game takes place indoors, your play area is massively expanded as you explore the depths of the testing facility and take a journey through the history of aperture science. You also learn about the backstory of GLaDOS, or genetic life form and disk operating system. Turns out, she was originally the doting personal assistant to the founder and CEO of Aperture Science, Cave Johnson, played by J.K. Simmons. Cave Johnson was a headstrong entrepreneur and visionary whose research policy was to throw science at the wall and see what sticks. This included putting human test subjects through a battery of trials to test the limits of man's ingenuity and creative potential. And at first, Aperture Science was riding high. And in the wake of World War II, the company called in astronauts, war heroes, and Olympians as its test subjects. But as the company began to lose money, likely because of their habit of maiming or killing their test subjects, their testing pool grew much smaller, until by the 1970s they were bringing in homeless people and their own employees in the 80s. Around about the same time, Cave Johnson had contracted a serious illness as a result of ingesting moon rocks for research into a conversion gel. He began looking at ways to transfer one's personality into a robotic body to prolong his life. But as Johnson withered away, he instructed the researchers to put his assistant Caroline in charge and implant her personality into an artificial husk, forcibly if necessary. And that was how Gladys was born. After Caroline was added as a genetic life form component, and after several failed attempts, Gladys succeeded in taking over the facility, killing most of the employees and trapping the rest along with many of their children who happened to be there for Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. One of those children happened to be Shell. Gladys was designed with a euphoric reward system that gratified her upon the completion of tests. And so she fully devoted herself to science and putting the employees through trials that usually resulted in their deaths. That is until the events of the first game, where Chell survives the tests and apparently destroys GLaDOS. Chell is then left in suspended animation for an unspecified period that, according to the developers, could be up to 50,000 years. She's finally woken up by a cheerful little robotic fop named Wheatley, played by Stephen Merchant who helpfully informs Chell that she may have suffered brain damage as a result of the extended cryosleep. The two resolve to escape the facility, but through a long series of events, Wheatley accidentally reactivates GLaDOS, Chell confronts her nemesis once again, and after supplanting her, Wheatley takes over the facility. However, the dim-winded robot becomes drunk on power almost instantly and refuses to let Chell leave, trapping GLaDOS in a potato and banishing the two to the depths of Aperture Science. It's here that we learn about the history of the company, starting with their glory years in the 40s and continuing through to the 70s, 80s, and the present, with the company and Cave Johnson himself becoming more and more decrepit. All of this, mind you, is communicated via audio logs, with the GLaDOS potato occasionally adding commentary, especially with regards to Caroline, 
though GLaDOS doesn't recall her human form as of yet. As you explore the history of aperture science and decommissioned test courses from throughout the 20th century, it's mostly just you and your thoughts. There's the audio logs and GLaDOS periodically pipes up, but you're mostly left to your own devices. And what a glorious time it is! No yokels interrupting your thoughts with their peasant concerns. No one nagging you to take out the trash, mow the lawn. It's my turn to wear the fireman's hat. No one telling you to pay child support. No, all the dialogue is just exquisite. It's mostly via non-interactive audio logs, which is just perfect for someone like me who'd rather burn his entire fortune than spend time with children or give a single penny to charity. Portal 2 gave you plenty of time to contemplate the existential meaning of reality, which allowed me to mull over the mysteries of the cosmos, the nature of our existence, without being interrupted by whiny little brats who want to be fed. So yes, with an end of the world scenario, which Portal 2 hints could be occurring outside following the events of Half-Life 2, which occurs in the same universe, mind you, in that desolated world, I'd definitely be a post-apocalyptic Ron Swanson, fully content in my magnificent solitude, unencumbered by the petty concerns of other people. I do also appreciate the game's dry British-style wit, which is inexplicable because the director, producer, and all the writers are either Yankees or, in the case of Jay Pinkerton, Canadian, but they still manage to inject the sort of humor that you'd only find in shows like the British version of The Office. But my favorite aspect by far is the complete lack of human contact and magnificent solitude. Be sure to show your appreciation for my efforts with a like, and I shall return to educate the great unwashed masses and all those of good letters and reading on the finer things in life and delightful cuisine.